Hey, JB, anything new on Malik? He's been medically cleared. Um, so today, our individuals today and tomorrow, he'll rejoin the group on Saturday. Um, I know that you can't, I mean, I know that he's been in isolation, but what is your hope as far as considering the time he's missed getting him back into this, the fray of things? Well, we'll just have to see where he's at. You know, we'll, we'll watch his individual today, see where he's at conditioning wise. It's going to take a minute just to get back to up to speed to where we're at, but uh, we'll take it one day at a time. I, I don't have an answer right now just because I haven't seen him yet. So I'll know more after today and tomorrow's workouts. Uh, we'll bring him back with the group on Saturday and then, and then uh, go from there. So, uh, but he has a good base underneath him, you know, off season, he had some good work. Um, hopefully he's not lost, you know, all the work he's put in. I don't anticipate that. I think he, he's got a good base to, to build back to. Thanks. Yep. Danny. Go to Danny. Uh, all right, let's go on to Jacob. Sam, congrats. Yeah, coach. Thank you, coach. I know. Uh, I know you've talked the the value of having multiple ball handlers or playmakers, I should say, on the court. But have you given a lot of thought about how you're going to stagger these guys like Lamelo and Gordon and Devonte, and just the value of having a, a playmaker like that on the court, pretty much for 48 minutes? Yeah, we'll have multiple playmakers on the floor. Um, I do like that. We'll stagger them. Um, I don't have an exact scenario right now for you, but you know, we're going to stagger. We're going to have multiple ball handlers on the floor at, at one time. And that, that starts with Devonte and Terry, Gordon, Miles, PJ, the twins. I mean, we have a number of guys that can play make, but um, you know, my goal is to have as many of them on the floor at once uh, throughout a game. Let's go to Sam Purley. Hey, JB, hope you're doing well. I have kind of a non-basketball related question. I know you had some thoughts on it this summer, but what was your reaction to the NBA coaching wardrobe uh, decision that no longer have to wear a suit during games? I think it's the best move the league's made in 25 years. It's been the best move yet. I think we're all, we're a lot smarter for it, I think. But um, I'm pumped, man. I like it. I think it looks uniform. I think it looks great. Um, I can't. I can't wait to try it out on Saturday night. And I'll let you know. You given I know any my staff. I know my, I know my staff is fired up. Have you given any thought to what you're going to wear, or is it obviously not on the front of your mind right now with training camp and everything going on? I heard a fashion coordinator, so just waiting for them to help me through it. You know, I got to get the right pants and the polo. We got. We got to look sharp here. But um, it's going to be new for all of us. But I think it looks great. So hopefully it works out for us this season. Let's try Danny Thompson again. Coach, can you hear me? I can. All right, perfect. Sorry about that, guys, earlier. Uh, Coach, two-part question. First part, uh, as we get closer to Saturday when you're doing the five-on-five -five scrimmages, are you doing more towards getting yourself prepared by what units you're putting together, or are you still just still in the experimental phase? It's both. It's both, Danny. I mean, there's stuff that we put in that we got to see um, executed out there, but there's also an evaluation piece. Let, let's see what these guys look like. Um, I want to be tinkering with lineups, sets, rotations. Um, a lot of this over the next four games is going to be about evaluation. And even when we start the regular season, we're going to be learning. I, I'm not going to know this team for the next, you know, two, three months. Uh, I've got a long ways to go. We have a long ways to go in figuring out how these guys blend together, how they fit together. Uh, this is a long process. I'm not going to, after you guys are going to ask me after one game, what I, I mean, I'm just not going to know. I mean, this is going to be a process, guys. I mean, it's going to take one game, two games. It may take. Our system uh, quickly and who can go execute it quickly. I think those are the guys that are going to be finding playing time. 
obviously you got to earn playing time this season. Nothing's given to you. You got to go earn minutes. Uh, there's depth here. There's versatility here. We got guys at multiple positions that want to play. And um, you're going to have to earn your time. And second part with Malik now officially being cleared more likely you say probably Saturday. Um, I'm sure we probably won't see him on Saturday, but is there a chance we might see him on Monday? I don't have an answer for you on that. I, I, I got to see where he's at the next two days. Um, could he potentially be there Monday? Yes, but um, I'll probably have more, more clarity after these two days um, and give you an answer probably you know, later in the weekend. Thanks, Coach. Yes. Let's go to Rod and then wrap up with Rick. Hey, JB, Rod here. Just wondering, um, you know, you mentioned a couple of days ago that, you know, uh, Gordon Hayward has kind of been a calming influence so far on the, on the court for you guys in practice and whatnot. Just wondering, what else have you learned about him so far? I know it's early on, a couple of weeks, but what have you learned about him that you probably didn't know before you came in to be with you guys now? That he likes donuts. I know he likes donuts. I do. I think he loves donuts. So he and I are going to get along very, uh, very well. Um, you know, he's just, he's a very coachable kid. You know, he, he's, he talks a tremendous amount on the court. You never know how a player reacts until you have them between the lines, but he loves to talk, loves to communicate. Um, Really likes he loves to to give praise to his teammates. That's the biggest thing I've seen so far. Like he want, he he gets a kick out of watching their success and what they're doing out there on the floor. Um, but he is he's taken control of the gym a number of times. You know, as a leader, uh, whether it's a correction or a praise for his teammates, and we need someone like that, someone to step up into that role, uh, who's been a winner, who's been a professional for a number of years. Uh, he commands respect immediately. And uh, he's really stepped into that role uh, these last few practices, especially. Hey, JB, yesterday when you were talking about the contrast between running concepts versus a lot of scripted plays, for the average fan, how does that look different? And how much of a departure is that from what you have done the last two seasons? either in terms of volume or philosophy? Yeah, you know, last season, we, we tried it a little bit more concept-based early. And, you know, it's a young group. It takes a while for a young group to play out of concepts um, and less structure and more read and react. And, you know, I found last year that was just tough for a young group to do. And um, so... We veered a little bit from that this season. There was a lot more play calls. It was a slower pace last year, putting the ball in maybe a couple guys' hands for the most part. This year, we have multiple ball handlers, multiple decision makers. And what I want is for us to be able to read and react, to play in different spots on the floor. Um, you know, having multiple ball handlers in pick and roll and, and dribble handoffs but really creating space for us to play out of and make decisions. And that's the thing we're really focused on right now is spacing, reading, reacting, and then re-spacing again. If you, if you look at the evolution of most NBA plays or basketball plays in general, there's usually some type of trigger play to start. From there, it doesn't mean you always score. You know, if you watch a college game tonight, you'll see one action followed by another action, still no shot, still no score. What do you look like after that? And I think that's where a lot of teams struggle is after that initial um, action or trigger that they're trying to run, when they break down, what happens next? And what we want to do is be able to just play after that one trigger and just create more offense out of our spacing and, and read and reaction for us. And to uh, what extent is, is you get moving in this direction um, in response to the fact that the two significant um, roster changes are people who are really good with the ball in their hands as far as making decisions? Yeah, that's right. I mean, th this had a, a lot to do with it because, I mean, obviously last year the ball was primarily in Devontae and Terry's hands for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. Their usage w was extremely high. And I still like the ball in their hands, but you're just tougher to guard when you have multiple ball handlers, people that can make decisions. And LaMelo is high-level decision-maker. I mean, we're talking about a high-level IQ, 
high level passer decision maker as is Gordon. So I don't want the ball stuck in one person's hands. We're just going to be tougher to guard when the ball's moving side to side with multiple decision makers, multiple ball handlers. In the end, that's tougher to guard than running a set. And I just live in a set with, with the ball in one guy's hands. What I expect is it doesn't matter who has it, make the right read, make the right play. I trust you guys to get to your spots, read and react and play off each other. Obviously, I need sets too, Rick. I mean, I have to, you know, I have to make play calls and, um, those are things we're going to continue to run. And I, I've put in only a couple of those things. You know, I've put in a few sets for us to play out of. But in the end, we want to be able to, to play after a play breaks down. And as you guys know, in the NBA, the best teams, they're not getting, they're not getting their first shot or best shot off their initial action. It's not really how it happens. You might trick a team once or twice in a game. It's really after that what happens. And the best teams have these playmakers you know, let's call it, you know, when the shot clock's 10 and below, that can go and make a play. My hope is that we do that with multiple guys built out of our spacing and our concepts once that play breaks down. So, um, but I think, you know, I'm speaking a lot on this question, but I think, you know, really our best offense should be that initial thrust that, that, that we're playing in transition and flow with high level decision makers. That's really where it starts for us. Once it gets into the half court, it's still about these concepts. Well, I just thought it was really interesting the other day when you used the word unpredictable as far as what you were trying to accomplish with this, that you didn't want to get into something so scripted that you were easily scouted. Yeah, it's tough to, it's tough to guard. I mean, you look at the best teams. I mean, they're just they're, they're playing out of concepts. You can't really scout a play, right? Horns twist five, whatever, the, you know, whatever a team throws out there, you can scout. You can prepare for that. It's really the, the depth of the depth of the offense starts after that. You know, once you run an initial action, and that's where we want to be. We want to be a very efficient team throughout the 24-second shot clock and not leave the ball in one guy's hands to create and make plays down the stretch. And I think that's what happened a lot last year. And that's okay. That's that that was that's that's what we were last year. And and that's okay. We we learned a lot through that. Um, but for us to be an efficient offense. Uh, we want to have multiple guys that can make plays, you know, in that second half of the shot clock.